be possible. Uh, I can't see because of the. There you go. Yeah. So stand in whatever way is your comfortable standing, and uh, I won't keep you standing a long time. I'm trying not to. When I was licensed in uh, 1970 at the East Virginia Conference, uh, Bishop J. Floyd Williams was the presiding officer, and me and several of us stood there for 45 minutes. And we deserved every minute of that. <laughs> but uh, I've never did forget it. I've done a long time to stand. Um, I want to read to you from Colossians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul, this is, these are the closing verses of uh, this little book. The Apostle Paul says, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And if you likewise read the epistle from the Laodiceans, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. That has become the text that I've used for years now, for licensing and often for ordinations. It's a text I go to personally, just as a reminder about what the Lord has spoken and, uh, over my life. And if your spouse is with you, even though your spouse may or may not hold ministerial credentials, your spouse is engaged in ministry with you. And some of us have been blessed to be in uh, Western Turkey and see, actually see this area where Colossae was and where the ancient city of Laodicea was located. The modern city of Damascus is there, and there's not an easy church there, by the way. And you stand there at the uh, archaeological ruins of Laodicea, you can look down the Blackest River Valley, you look about 20 clicks, and you can see a hill down there that hasn't been excavated too much, that is where ancient Colossae was located. The Apostle Paul writes to these churches, and in particular, he apparently had not been to the church of Colossae, but he knew people of Colossae. These were house churches. They weren't in big buildings like this. They were small congregations of, of people who come to faith in this messianic figure of, of Israel, the people of the group who were calling Jesus. And uh, they had recognized him as the Messiah of Israel, the Christos, Christ. I find it interesting when I read this that there's a letter I wish. Holy Spirit need to preserve the letter that we now see in the Paul wrote. The only letter we've got is the one that John the Evangelist wrote under the anointing of the Holy Spirit some 30 years later. It's recorded in the book of Revelation. I am confident that somewhere the book of Laodicea that Paul wrote is in the cloud. That, that was a test to see who's awake. <laughs> and uh, when, when uh, I get to heaven, I plan to uh, download that and, and read it. But it's an issue. When you read Paul's letters, Paul, Paul begins usually by talking about theology, who Jesus Christ is. He's no different than this letter very clear about talking who Jesus Christ is and the superiority of Jesus Christ. The, he moves forward through this brief little letter. We, we've got traffic lights in Oklahoma City, but you can sit long enough and read Colossians. <laughs> and um, the, he moves through and he begins to talk about how you live in the world. Because theology and how you live are not disconnected. Christian theology is never just uh, immoral out there somewhere as some kind of a metaphysical blandness. It's always rooted in history. It's rooted in God's creative and historic acts with Israel. It's rooted profoundly in the revelation 
revelation of who God's only begotten Son is. And his, his incarnation, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, sending of the Holy Spirit. And, and all of that forms the background of what it means to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And so as I'm speaking to all of you, I'm speaking to myself and to all of us in here. Before we hold credentials in the conference, which are important, but before that, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are that whether we have credentials or not. And, and every follower of Jesus, because all the church believes that every follower of Jesus has a ministry. This is, if you don't remember this, go find B.B. Underwood's book on spiritual gifts, ministries, and manifestations. A uh, book written nearly 40 years ago, but it's still significant for the Pentecostal Holy Church and understanding the ministries that God has given to every follower of Jesus in his body. But as you stand here for credentials, you're doing something a little different. You will make them a covenant today. You that are being ordained, many of you have already gone through the licensing process. And you've heard words similar to what I'm saying now. But this is a reminder to you. But for you that are standing before me, you are making covenant with the other ministers in the International Pentecostalist Church, not just in this conference, but literally around the world. Your credentials have just as much value in South Africa, in Kenya, in, in Argentina, in Canada, as they have in any state in the Union. And you are part of thousands men and women around the world who were forming this collegial of followers of Jesus who said, we made covenant with this movement that's 120 years old that we believe God has called to bear witness to Jesus Christ in our generation. And we're making covenant with you. This is important. This is not joining the Rotary Club. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a member of a Rotarian in Oklahoma City. But this is different than that. This is a commitment we are making one with the other into our Lord Jesus Christ. And making covenant means that, that there's a foundational commitment to which we all subscribe. And I'm going to want to hear you say some things to me. And not. We believe this book is the authoritative inspired the word of God. I want to know that you really believe that. Yes. Yes. I want to know that you are being ordained. You really do believe that. I want to know that you really do believe that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yes. This is not a Christmas myth. This is not an excuse to exchange gifts. This is the reality of the incarnation. God became flesh. The Word became flesh to dwell among us, full of truth and glory and grace. And it's important that I hear that you actually do believe that. I'm not asking you to understand it. I don't understand a lot of it, but I believe it. I will know that you genuinely believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, truth, and life. And his shed blood is the only way for the forgiveness of sin. I want to know you really believe it. You really I want to know that you truly believe that Jesus Christ truly died on the cross. And his shed blood can wash away all our sin and condemnation. His shed blood can bring sanctifying grace into our lives. I want to know you really believe that. I want to know that you really believe that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. Not an idea, not a myth. His body wasn't stolen. They didn't give him a drug. 
The Romans knew how to kill you. He was really dead. And he was really raised from the dead. Do you really believe that? So all of you, all of us face that. But we also know from the word of God that God will always provide a way of escape. This is why we're in community with one another. This is why in the midst of the temptation, get on the phone, call your bishop, call your pastor who stood with you, call your wife, call your husband, say, I can't be alone right now. That doesn't mean you're no less sanctified. In fact, we refuse to do that. It's a pretty good indication that you're really not sanctified very much at all. Because you're trying to live the Christian life by yourself. 
We're never called to do that. We're called to be in community with one another. When we're out there by ourselves, trying to do it by ourselves, we are really vulnerable. This is why the Word of God says that, that our enemy, Satan, is up the line. He's out there looking. We're all from the pack. You're dead meat. We're dead meat. So we're making covenant to stand up for another. You're making covenant with your resources, your financial resources. You men and women that are standing in front of me are making covenant that from this day on, on every source of income, whether it's ministerial or your secular job, whatever that is, on every source of income, you're going to tie 10% of that income to the North Carolina Commons. Do you understand? I, I, I need a nod here. <laughs> yeah, you please get quiet. Please. We can tell when the real temptation starts. I mean, this has got nothing to do with, you know, the organization wants your money. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the biblical principle of tithing. That this denomination is committed to, it's not rooted in the law of Moses. It is rooted in Genesis, where Abraham meets Melchizedek. And Abraham, by faith, responds to what God has done as the king of righteousness is revealed. This is not a legalism issue. This is a faith issue, which is why Malachi tells us that if we will trust God in this area of our lives, he will open the windows of heaven and he'll pour out blessings upon us from way beyond our company. And for most of us, when the window gets open, it's not that we need more money. We probably need fewer bills. God knows what we really need in our lives. Blessings over our marriage. Blessings over our children. Blessings over our ministry. That's far more important whether or not you get more money. But the principle of obedience out of faith is what drives this Pentecostal church understanding of time. And that's a scriptural understanding. This conference leadership, the denomination, Bishop Barber and I, representing the executive committee, we, we're making covenant with you. We're making covenant with you to be, to be faithful to the Lord as best we can. To be faithful to you. To try your leadership to lead the Pentecostal Church in North Carolina, in Eastern North Carolina, in faith and in commitment to the Word of God. They're praying for you. Now they're going to come to some of you and they're going to knock on your door and they're going to say, we think God is calling you to lead the church you're in. We need you over in this area. Will you pray about God? Your response is, Bishop, we will pray and discern what God is speaking to us. But we also trust that God is speaking to you as leaders in the Pentecostal world of the church. And we're going to trust you. Because if the bishop and the council, this is not something where they just pick a name out of a, of a hat. This is not, this is not the NBA law, okay? This is prayer. And God's putting you on, on leadership heart and saying, God's got his hand upon this person. And there seems to be a fit from God out there. And you're making covenant to say, I'm going to take that very seriously. And if they come to me and they say, we really want you to do this, you're willing to do that. And they're making covenant to you that they're not going to do that lightly and casually. They're not punishing you. They are seeking to find where God's call can be best fulfilled in your life. Well, after saying all of that, are you sure you want to be a minister in Pentecost Church? <laughs> Young lady, are you sure? 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 Okay. Are you sure? And if you're sure, my brother and sister, you're sure. You're sure. You're sure. You're sure. You folks down here to be ordained. You sure you want to go through this today? You might, not, you might not wait till next year until there's a simple presiding conference. <laughs> but you're sure? You mean more than I have a lot out there. You're sure? You 
Thank you. 